chill us out. Hey, not much. Uh, I jinx myself. The weather sucks today. Haha. <laughs> it's funny because I just was with um a new student who's also in Miami, and I was telling him like how I have another student who's also in Miami, and like the hurricane just goes right past to like Tampa or whatever. But uh, yeah, another person in Miami, and then I have another student who's also in Miami. So, but. The weather sucks, but that's probably because, but it's not like as bad as like straight up the hurricane, right? Because everywhere else it's like flooded and stuff, right? Exactly, yeah. So, Just rain. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right. Yeah. What would you, what did you, yeah. What would you want to go over today? Um, basically just a couple topics. Yep. Um, review like electrochemistry and then there's a couple different problems I wanted to go over in regards to like solubility and Yep. stuff um so yeah we could i don't know what we should start with Um so like do you have like a uh... any like practice questions like that you have okay we could do that let me i request it to record Yeah, so this is the first question. Um, uh, just one sec. Let me pick something. Okay. Um, all right. In preparation for designing a solvent system for a chemical reaction, a scientist reviewed the measurements of the solubility of ammonium chloride um, reported in the scientific literature for four common organic amide solvents. The various reported values expressed in three different units of concentration were averaged uh, yielding the results in table one. Table one, solubility of um, ammonium chloride in a selected amide solvent solvents at 25C. So when it's form amide, then, uh, okay, which has a density of that and solubility is that in terms of mass of the solute over mass of the solvent. Uh, we also have it as mass of the solute over liters of the solvent. And then we have good old molarity. And then for the methyl, okay, for the next one, we have a lower, like half the solubility, sort of. Um, and uh, for the slightly lower density and then lower density beyond that is much lower solubility. And then... density goes a little bit higher, and then we have 0.9 molarity. So, okay, if, if a 1.4 gram sample of ammonium chloride is placed in a 25 milliliter, is placed in 25 milliliters of N-methyl formamide at 25C, the sample will, uh, okay. So for that, let's see. 
Well, okay. How would like did you approach this? Uh, it was pretty hard. I mean, I was I was just like really overwhelmed with all the numbers. Yep. So I didn't really know where to start here. Um, like, yeah. Okay. I mean, I know the methyl form amp form amide. Um, we have to look at that row. Uh huh. But um. It's probably has something to do with the grams per hundred grams of solvent, so five point eight nine, something with that. Okay. So let's see. Um. Now. This is the thing, and um. We can use this. So, okay, we have different values of solubility, right? So, if they're giving, yeah. you're look. I think you're looking at the different one. Oh yeah, that and oh damn it! <laughs> All right, so okay, that's fine. Um, because we. have the oh that's okay that's fine so we have the okay so does it make sense that we're that we're gonna try to do this solve for this over here okay is there giving us because like the different values of solubility um so okay they're giving us the mass of the solute and the volume of the solvent in milliliters which Right. So, you know, so if we had a value here in grams per liter, that would be perfect. But we don't have that. So we look at what we do have. We have grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent. So how do we go from milliliters to, you know, grams? We can use the density, right? And the density is one gram per milliliter, which means 25 milliliters would be 25 grams, right? Mm, okay. And then we just do, so, okay, it's supposed to be 5.89 grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent, right? And we can just mm -hmm. set that as a proportion, or rather we don't need to set it as a proportion, This is the solubility here. And what we have is 25, or rather, sorry, we have 1.4 grams of solute in 25 grams of solvent. Now, okay. multiply this by four over four, just so I get 100 grams on the bottom. And then four times 1.4, um, that'll be kind of like, 60 or six, I mean, a little less than that. Um, but I'm pretty sure it'll be like six or something. A little, um, I can do a little better. So 1.5 is, it'll be 5.6. So, um, okay. And now solubility, right? The value, like this value here, is the maximum, you know, concentration or a maximum amount of solute that you can add to the solvent for it to be soluble. Yeah. So um, now since, since this value that we get got is smaller than this value, that would make it soluble, right? Mm-hmm. So D is out, um, and for the rest, they're talking about solubility limit. So, so this is saying equals exceed, not exceed, right? So even if we didn't, so okay, we can see that this 
is smaller. So it should be not exceed, right? Yeah. But even if we didn't know that, right? If we didn't know that, you know, when that this ends up being uh, something that does not exceed the solubility limit, intrinsically for each of these prop like choices, if something exceeds its solubility limit, it should not dissolve. So this part is not consistent with this part. Wait, if it exceeds solubility, wouldn't it start forming crystals? Uh, yeah. And so it would fully dissolve, no? Well, if it and then start forming crystals. Oh, so yeah, it'll it'll dissolve as much as it can. Uh, after which point it'll maintain, uh, it'll, it'll continue to be a solid. So rather than, I guess, saying forms a crystal, it will, if it starts off as a crystal or AKA a solid, it'll, it'll remain a solid. But, um, but essentially if you have a valid, so this is, this is your solubility limit here. So if you're, if the amount that you have is less than the solubility limit, it will fully dissolve. Okay. And if it's beyond the solubility limit, it won't dissolve. Wait, what? Really? Yep. Oh. Yeah. So like, um, I mean, like, let's say that, you know, you put some sugar in your coffee, right? And like let's say the maximum amount that you can put in for it to be dissolved is i don't know like 10 grams so that's the maximum amount let's say for like one cup of coffee or something so if you put in 11 grams in a cup of coffee 10 of those grams will dissolve but one gram won't and that will just remain you know that solid form Okay, I know what I'm confusing this with. I'm confusing this with um KSP, KSP and Q. Yeah. So KSP, similar thing, right? Uh it's just gonna be in molarity. But because like KSP would be like something like, I don't know, four times ten to the negative ten uh like molar or something. So that just means that this is the max concentration. So if you have a concentration lower than this, it'll be soluble. If you have a concentration um, larger than this, it will not be soluble. Because that KSP is the max concentration for at which something can be, uh, be soluble. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so, so this is just them talking about the same concept using different words. So yeah, so so I want you to see that there's multiple ways that we can come to this answer. One way was doing the math, finding out that our value is 5.6 per 100 grams, which is lower than the solubility limit, which means that it will fully dissolve, right? But if we didn't know that, simply from these choices, like if it says exceeds solubility limit, that should mean that it, it you know wouldn't really dissolve, right? And then if it exactly reaches it, same kind of thing. But yeah, so we see that our value is less, so it will not exceed its solubility limit and that means it will fully dissolve um and form an unsaturated solution how do we know that it forms a uh, unsaturated like how do we know if something's saturated good question so let's say that it's equal like the amount of the sample is equal to its solubility limit right then it would form a solute, uh, sorry, a saturated solution. But now how, what if it's, what if, 
where you are dealing with malaria in Q equals KSP. Is that one of their saturated? When you say the Q part, what do you mean by that? Like reaction quotient? Yes. But um, like KSP usually deals with like a solid being dissociated. Hold on, I might be referring to. Mm -hmm. So, what I actually mean when I say Q is IP, not Q. IP. IP? So, look, ion product. When it is greater than KSP, there will be precip. Wait, I'm not. I'm not sharing my window. Hold on. I am product. I never seen IP in that context. Really? Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I feel like it's just like it's just like another way of denoting oh, like ion product. Okay. Yeah. Um analogous to reaction quotient. You could plug in the concentration and you put it in. Got it. Okay. Um yeah. Yeah, I've never seen that word, but um, but it, I guess it makes sense because if some oh yeah, there you go. Well, oh, I see what you're saying about the crystals now. So, like, okay, so let's let's just say that solubility, right, is going to be um some value that is the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in some solvent. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So if it's uh less than that, it will be soluble and not and and unsaturated. If it's like equal to that, it'll be soluble but saturated. Okay. Right? And then if it's greater than that, it'll be we could say super saturated, sure, but we can also just say uh it won't dissolve anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, so like if we didn't use any of the values here, we know intrinsically that, um, like, you know, that if something is exceeding its solubility limit, it'll be like, whatever, like, uh, super saturated, et cetera. But yeah, so we just essentially did the, the math here, um, and yeah, it should be A, right? Okay. So, yeah. So, we, uh, to, to bring it back, what we did was we looked at, we're given mass of solute and we're given liters of solvent. And naturally, we would use something here. But since that's not given, we need to figure out how we can turn the milliliters into grams. And we can do that by looking at the density of the solvent, which is just one, meaning one gram per ml. So that means 25 mls of this is 25 grams, which means we can now start to compare it to this. Sure. All right. Um, okay, what's the solubility of ammonium chlor uh, chloride in N-methyl um, acetamide expressed as grams of that per grams of 100 grams of solute? Same kind of deal. But now, look, we don't have that, right? Mm -hmm. And you know what? We don't have this either. So we can't use, you know, the... Uh, density thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like we were able to previously, because previously we were given um, liters and we use density to find out how to convert liters into grams. But here 
we're not given anything in liters, so we're not going to be able to use density. But we are given molar mass. And that can help us find the number of moles. And then we can use the molarity value, right? Okay. So let's see. So one mole of, oh, wait. Oh, sorry. The molarity here is going to be, so, okay, we can, so this molarity value here um, should represent the, oh, wait, sorry. Okay, they're just asking for grams of, um, solute over grams of solvent. So what we can use, so we can use this molarity value, which should be um, moles of the solute. Oh, so 0 0.9 is moles of the solute, which is ammonium chloride, divided by liters of the solvent, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, um, okay, so we have 100 grams of solvent. And now, uh, since we have the density of the solvent, we can tell that this is going to be, um, Nine one two ninety six milliliters because N methyl acetamide has a density of point nine six grams per milliliter, All right? And so, you know, we can even set a proportion. So, what if we have like how many milliliters? Or we can just do like unit conversion, so 100 grams would give us, or rather, we could just do um, 100 grams over 0 0.96 grams per milliliters to get 96 uh milliliters right yeah yeah so will we then plug that into that equation 0 0.9 equals a mole and then we get the moles of nh4cl mm -hmm. yep so the 0.9 here should then be the 0 0.9 times the, or rather, okay, let's see, 0 0.9 moles of the solute per liter. And we can do, let's do, here, I'm gonna just redo this. Okay, so we have, so the 0 0.9 is the molarity or moles of NH4Cl over liters of the solution. And we can use this to calculate. So one mole of ammonium chloride is equal to 53.5 grams of the ammonium chloride. And this will cancel out the moles and we'll just get grams per um, liter of solution, like, you know, this value here. So this is like 0.9 times 53.5 is probably gonna be like 50 
or something like that. 49, something like that, right? So, well, okay, 10% of 53.5 is 5.3. So 90% would be this minus the 5.3, right? So 48, right? 48 grams of um, ammonia, ammonium chloride, right? Per uh, Per liter of solution, right? Does it make sense how I did that? Uh, well, mm -hmm. so hold on. Uh, something is not adding up. Mm -hmm. So, because I had 0 0.9 equals... Moles NH four CL over zero point zero nine six L. Uh huh. So, um, so what we can start off with is the point nine molarity value being like so. If it's equal to the moles of ammonium chloride per liter, then that's that means it's going to be 0. 0.9. So like for 0. 0.9 moles of ammonium chloride per liter, that's just the 0. 0.9 molarity value. And since we want, so like, I, I guess what we can do is, so this question is asking us for the solubility in grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent, right? Yeah. And we don't have any idea how many grams of solute we are going to have. All we have is the molarity of the solute. Mm -hmm. So we take that here, and then we use the gram formula mass or the molar mass to solve for the number of, or rather to convert from moles of the solute to mass of the solute. Okay. Because what we need to find out is mass of solute and mass of solvent, right? Yeah. And, you know, they're giving us the molarity of the solute in the solvent, and they're giving us molar mass of the solute. So we can take the molarity, which is 0.9 moles per liter, and that 0.9 mole part, we can convert into mass using the molar mass, right? And that gives us the mass of solute in the solution, right? So, so I get 48 grams of solute per liter of solution. And now I need to convert the liter of solution or solvent, you know, into mass, right? Yeah. And so this is where we can do, you know, the, uh, um, the density value, like to get, so let's see. So let's convert this into milliliters. So one E negative three liters is one milliliter, right? And we know that the density of the solvent is 0.96 grams per milliliter. So in one milliliter, we would have 0 0.96 grams of the solvent, right? Mm -hmm. So now if we do the math here, we're gonna get 48 E negative three grams of the ammonium chloride 
divided by 0.96 grams of the solvent and so this is roughly 0 0.048 over 0.96. Um, right? And so this would be um, closest, oh, wait a sec, grams of point oh, yeah, point one, two, three, point oh, four, eight grams of that divided by grams plus. Like that. Here, maybe I could do, um, let me see, okay, 48 grams per liter, one liter, one E, three milliliters, one milliliter, point nine, oops, point nine six. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Sorry. So, okay, this is the answer here, but we want to take that, well, we want to, I guess, see what, which one of these things it can equal. So we can kind of just, I think I'm off by like a factor of 10 here, but yeah. Okay. I don't think you are, because if you multiply the fraction that you got times 10, top, both denominator and numerator get 100. I mean, you get the answer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, basically, yeah. You could just multiply it by 10 over 10 uh, to get that 100 on the bottom. But the main thing here, though, is just that... Uh, we are being asked to find this thing here, and we are given um, the molar mass of it. So we're going to use the molarity value and the molar mass to figure out the mass of solute. And then we use um, the density of the solvent to figure out the mass of the solvent. And then it'll just, and then it's just, you know, the mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solvent. So, so yeah, this one, if you multiply it by 10 over 10, you'll get 0.48 over 0.96. And that's going to be closest to the, uh, yeah, the five thing. Uh, okay. Oops. Compared to the solubility of the ammonium chloride in pure form amide, what effect would dissolving KCl okay, into the four amide have on the solubility? Uh, well, what do you think? Um, I would think that it would increase it. So... Let's see. So um, let's just say that we take this and we throw it in water. Like I know what they're saying formamide, but let's just say we throw it in water, right? Um, what would this dissociate into? Uh, NH4 plus and CL minus. Good. 
So now what if we what will happen if we increase the concentration of Cl minus? It's going to go left. Yep. So solubility would decrease. Mm -hmm. Common ion effect. Yeah. Yep. When you say throw in water, when you do that, why, why don't you write H2O on the left? Oh, yeah. Because there's no need to do that because I'm going to then have to write something like that on the right. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right, well, so then why is it for 11 and how would it, what would happen? Um, it should be the same thing. Oh, really? Yep. I just, I thought it would like react or something with formamide and I don't know. Oh, yeah. So this, so they're telling us here that these are just solvents, right? And well, I guess this actually answers the question of why we wouldn't put H2O. Um, because H2O would just function as a solvent here. And that's going to be implied. Like, let's say if this is solid, this would be aqueous, aqueous. And the aqueous, it being aqueous implies that, or means that it's it's in a solution of water. So, um, so yeah, there, the reason I said let's pretend it's water is because technically these are organic amide solvents. And it's not readily known to us that that's going to cause dissociation, but typically it's easy to do that for water. But yeah, it's it's the common ion effect. Um, you know, like uh, for instance, what if you know we have HCl right, um, which dissociates into H plus and Cl minus, right? If you had, let's say, uh, you dump, and uh, you know some NaCl over here or something like that, it's going to make it less, you know, acidic because it's going to, well, Shotley's principle is going to have it shipped to the left because you have too much of that product. Uh, I'm an ion effect, yeah. But something that's a strong ass like that, is it actually going to do something? Doesn't it fully dissociate? It fully dissociates, um, you know, on its own, right? But if we added a common ion, it will it will just be shifted yeah to the left so you can you can kind of mess with or change you know the i don't know if i should say change the acid strength but you can definitely alter you know alter how much of it dissociates if you do like the common ion effect or something like that uh but that's pretty much what this is so so yeah, to answer your question, um, solvents, when we consider something to be a solvent, it's not going to really react with the thing. I mean, it reacts with the thing in, in order to have it dissociate, right? Um, but it's not going to like remove anything from it, right? Okay. Okay. So... Which of the following modifications to the experimental procedure to prepare the solutions will most likely increase the amount of ammonium chloride that dissolves in the amide solvents in table um, one? Okay, this is this. I think this is kind of like what I was aim, uh, kind of was going to ask with that HCl example with pH because. Okay, so let's see. So, um, increase the amount of the ammonium chloride that will dissolve. So, so okay, the ammonium chloride. We talked about it dissolving into ammonium and chloride ion, but the chloride ion. I'm sorry. The ammonium ion can act sort of as a acid because it's going to want to get rid of a proton. Like NH4 plus should turn into just ammonia and H plus, right? Yeah. So if we want to... Um, 
if we increase the amount of H plus, this will shift to the left, right? Jeez. I mean, yes, it will. Um, that's going to shift, I guess, the main equation to the left. Uh huh. Yeah. So that would be if we decrease the pH. So we don't want that, right? But if you, uh, if you, B is like increasing pH, basically. What's up? B, the answer choice B then would be correct because that's like increasing the pH. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, which means if we're decreasing the pOH, we're increasing the amount of OH minus hydroxide ions, which react with the H plus, right, to produce H2O, right? Neutralizing it. So we have a decrease then in the H plus concentration, which would push the reaction um, forward. Why does that push it forward again? When you make water, it just like... Oh, yeah. So if you have H... Oh, because H will decrease. H will decrease. Yeah, the OH minus will bind to H plus to form H2O. And that will be like neutralizing, you know, the, the acid. And so we're taking H plus out of this equation. And thus it will... Proceed forward, uh, Le Chatelier again. Do you see this? Mm -hmm. Like the Google Doc? Uh huh. So, how would you do something like this? Super basic, but with Arrhenius, Arrhenius is Arrhenius, whatever. Like that first definition. Like, how do you find if something is a base like that it produces oh ions mm -hmm. um okay let's see i was doing like some of the uh prints and review uh -huh. like i looked at some of the problems um for electrochem and then acid bases and Uh, they're pretty useful. Like, I didn't do all of them, but this was, like, one of them. It's super basic. It's just usually I'm dealing with Lewis bases or Ronsidlari bases. So I'm not really good at the uh -huh. or, or any of the space. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is um not as straightforward of a question. Uh, question. So an Arrhenius space is defined as... As what? Oh, uh, it's defined as something that produces OH minus ions. Yep. Yep. When it dissolves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So now it's these are not very straightforward choices, uh, in terms of what looks like it can dissociate into hydroxide. But let's try it out, right? So at the very least, we can maybe see that some of these things are acids. Like this is. uh hypochlorous acid right yeah um so it's 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 an acid um also um all arrhenius acids can be under the larger category of bronze lowry acids but you could have bronzillary acids that are not Arrhenius acids. And then Lewis acids will be the largest, the broadest category. But um, yeah, so A is not a... Yeah, do, do you, does it make sense what I mean by this? It makes sense what you mean by it. I mean, I don't like... Meaning, meaning that um, if something is not a bronzillary acid, it cannot be a Arrhenius acid, but it could still be a Lewis acid. Yeah, yeah, like all Lewis. Yeah. There's some Lewis acids that aren't. Yes. Does this apply to Lewis acids and bases? Oh yeah, for for everything. So like you could have uh you could have some Lewis acids or bases that are not Bronte Lowry acids or bases, but 
you can't have, but every single Bronson Lowry Asseter base will still be a Lewis Asseter base. Mm -hmm. So for this question, right away, right, um, it's not very easy to see that any of these form an OH minus. It's not yeah. like NaOH or something easy or like that, right? So what strategy I'm using is, can I at least tell that they're bronze Lowry acids or bases? Because if something is not a bronze Lowry base, it cannot be an Arrhenius base, right? You, do you see what I mean by that? This is like a uh, logic, like math logic. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So, so okay. I get it though. Yeah. So HClO, uh, so HClO is a bronze Lowry acid, which means that it must be also an Arrhenius acid. Yeah. So it cannot be an Arrhenius base, so that's out. And then HBrO two is also going to be an acid. Not because of the HBr, but I mean, yeah, because of that, but also with the oxygens. I mean, it's not an acid that we've really seen much often, but basically these guys can donate their protons and be bronze Lowry acids, so they can't be the answer. And then this would probably just break apart into that uh, carbonate uh, anion. Um and that can and that wants to be protonated, so maybe it can, you know, when you put it in water, it can deprotonate the water to turn into HCO3 and OH minus. So I think it'll be C. Yeah, it is. It is. Yep. So yeah, when I first yeah, readily, like when you look at it, yeah, they're not making it easy for us here with an OH in it. So that's when you know, I, I use some logic of bronze Lowry. You know, if it's not a bronze Lowry base, then it cannot be an Arrhenius base. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, how do we do this? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, would it just be, um, like, you write again, NH4Cl dissolves into NH4 plus Cl? Uh-huh. So, so, yeah. So, so far, this passage has been asking us sort of, like, the same question just using different things like the first one we had to find this so we had to use different things uh the one after that we had to find that so we use different things here they give us everything uh but for ksp which one would be used similarity yep so basically that so that should just be. No, the issue here is I forgot to do the x squared. Yeah, yeah. Let me not just jump the gun like that. But yeah, right. We talked about this yesterday. Like, so you'll have equal amounts of the ammonium and chloride. So that'll be the x squared is equal to the 0 0.03, which is 3e negative 2. And you remember how to do the square root here? Yeah. Like of of that whole thing. Uh yeah. Like how would you do a root of something? I mean, it would just be square root of three times ten to the negative one, though. No? So uh so what I mean is, um I mean like what if we had to do like the fourth root? Uh you could do it to the one fourth power. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, good, good, good. So, yeah, we just take this to the one half power, right? So, that'll mean e to the wait. Sorry, ksp is what we're trying to find. So, 
x is the this thing, right? So we square it, right? Oh, if 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 it was KSP, then that would be equal to the x squared. But we're looking for KSP, and we're given the molarity of the of the thing. So it's the x that we have. So yeah, we square this. Uh, okay. Because like if we square yeah, yeah, yeah. this would be like 1.4 E1. And that's not a choice. There's this thing with zero power. I guess if there was a one there, then that could be tricky. But okay. yeah. So. Okay, so next is this. Um, I have such a big issue percent yield mm -hmm. questions. Got it. It's just yeah, if you can explain how you go about this, because it, it's really just all these. Like, I don't have. I feel like I don't have a good basis uh -huh. in stoichiometry, unfortunately, and so that's why I have issues with a lot of these problems. Yeah, so uh, percent yield, right, um, is, so would it be like, so it's going to involve like a theoretical value and an actual value, right? Like let's, if you did the experiment, right, and you get some value, you can compare that to the theoretical value, right? What is, what is really the difference? Is one like yeah. uh, the hypothesis? Like, so like, you hypothesize it? Yeah. So like if you, so like, you know, we have like a balanced reaction here and let's say you had, I don't know, one mole of this, right? You, so okay, if there's four moles of this and there's 24 moles of this, that's six times. So if you had one mole of this, this should be six moles of NAF, right? Um. Yeah. Or um um. So let like uh, let me just do it like this. So let's say we had four moles of this, right? Mm -hmm. We should have like twenty four moles of this, right? Yeah. That's the theoretical. Let's say that when we do the experiment, though, because, you know, st we're not perfect or whatever, and you start with the four mole, uh, moles of this, and you're going to get, you're not going to get anything higher than 24 moles of this, right? And if you did it absolutely perfectly without, like, any of the little molecules getting stuck in the glassware or whatever, it could be 24 uh, moles of this. But likely it's going to be less than 24 moles of this. Let's say like 22 moles of this, right? That'll be your actual like yield. So if you compare your actual to the theoretical, that will be your percent yield. How much, because let's say it's 100% yield. That means that the actual amount is equal to the theoretical, which is the maximum amount. So percent yield will be just, uh, you know, if you were to do the experiment um, compared to the theoretical maximum. So actual over theoretical times 100 would be the formula. Got it. Okay. Yep. So for this, well, okay. So when, so they give us a certain number of moles of that and they give us the liters of sodium hydroxide that also has molarity value there the following disproportionation what is that yeah I don't know. it's probably some uh type of well let's see it came up in a problem that i was doing today in electrochem i think it's uh redox then 
Yes, it is Redux. Because here XE is attached to something. Here it's on its own. If it's on its own, it has an oxidation state of zero. When it's with something, it's going to be something else. So this is this could be plus six or something. But um, yeah, I guess it's that. So, but yeah, always get to learn new words because I just learned that as well now. So, okay, cool. So this reaction occurs. Uh, what's a percent yield of the sodium thing for this reaction if that many moles of this thing is produced? All right. So how do you think we should approach this? Uh, I, I always get so overwhelmed with all the numbers, but I mean, I think basically we have to. So let's think about it like this. So the balanced reaction is the theoretical ratios, right? Yeah. And the ones that they're telling us about um, are the actual values that we have. So we can use the actual values that we have and then use the balanced reaction to see, for instance, if you have like, well, four moles of this, you would get three moles of that, right? So we calculate what the actual value of this is that we have, and we use this four to three, you know, mole ratio, to figure out how much of that we have. Or so would we do two times ten negative four over nine times ten to negative five? Well what well um I'm thinking about whether we uh let me think about what to do with the sodium hydroxide, um, if that plays a role here. Um, oh, wait, you know, because we have it there. So, okay, I get it. So, yeah, we're going to do what you said, but we also have to do it for sodium hydroxide, right? And for sodium hydroxide, they're not giving us the number of moles, but... Yeah, we get them. From the molarity? Yeah, from molarity and uh, volume, right? Correct, yeah. Good. So, yeah, okay. So we have the 2 moles, or 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of the xenon fluoride or whatever, and we have the... Um, point... Okay, I'm just going to do this 2e minus 2 liters times 3e minus 1 molar is 6e minus 3 moles, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, and... How do you do this when you have three different values? Yeah. We have NOH moles, we have XE, FE6 moles, okay. Mm -hmm. And we have, but I, I'm just confused here. Yeah. So, okay, let's see. So, mm, the, oh. so, okay, let's do, Um, okay, 2 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of x, e, f, 6, and we have the, so for every, okay, for, uh, for, for 4 moles of X E F six. I'm going to do thirty six 
moles of NaOH. And let's see. Okay, so four goes into um whoops. Um four goes into um thirty-six um eight no. Four goes into thirty-six. What can I do is very basic math. Um I'll do 72 over four, one, eight, 18, I think. Yep. So I got. All right, that many moles of Na. Oh, wait. Uh, and E I'm... negative four. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's how many moles of sodium hydroxide we need and Then for the okay, I'm trying to think. So we have okay, I get it. So okay, this is this is as you said, yeah, because we're dealing with three things here. So what we're really doing here is for any like reaction, right? There's going to be something that will be a limiting reagent. Yeah. Right? Now that's important here because, because if, so the amount of sodium hydroxide we have is more than the sodium hydroxide we need. So this is how much we have, and this is how much we need, right? Yeah. So that means that the sodium hydroxide that we have is in excess, which means that the xenon fluoride is the limiting reagent, right? Why? Because if we only need 18 times 10 to the negative four moles of sodium hydroxide for the reaction to proceed, we have more than that, right? So that means that we have that we have six times 10 to the negative three moles of NaOH. So that means that we have an excess of sodium hydroxide, which means that the amount of this uh sodium uh xenon thing uh oxygen thing that we have that we're trying to figure out because the, okay the issue here is is we could use this to figure out the amount of this or we could use this right so yeah. which one do we use we use whichever one is the limiting reagent because that will it will so so if we have an excess of sodium hydroxide, that's not gonna be what determines how much of product we get. Because the xenon fluoride is gonna be the limiting reagent, which means that that gets used up. And when we have no more of the xenon fluoride left, that reaction is done. Can't go any further. Because we use up the, the xenon fluoride first. Okay, so that means so so in a 
question like this, where they're giving us values for like more than one reactant, we ask ourselves, okay, which reactant um, is this reaction going to be, uh, is this reaction going to be limited by, right? And it's going to be limited by that limiting reagent, which means that that limiting reagent gets used up and then we don't have any more of it and that reaction can no longer proceed. Mm -hmm. So the limiting reagent is what determines how much product we get. Because okay. it gets used up first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we found the moles of both reactants and using the so like the coefficients in the balanced reaction, we were able to determine that we have excess sodium hydroxide. So we're not going to use that to figure out how much product we get because we're limited by the limiting reagent. So, and, you know, we need a lot less sodium hydroxide than how much we have. So that means it's going to be determined by the amount of the limiting reagent, which is the xenon fluoride, right? And so we're going to use that to figure out the amount of the uh, sodium xenon oxide thing. So, yeah, so we can use that. So we're going to do 2E minus 4 moles of xenon fluoride. And then that would be for four moles of xenon fluoride, we would get uh, three moles of the Na4XeO6, this thing. So this could just be four goes into, or two over four is one half, one half times um, three is 1.5 E minus four um, moles of the Na4XeO6. So that's how many moles um, uh, that we should get with the amount of xenon fluoride that we have, right? Yeah. Okay. And we we just put in the fraction. So yeah, you know, we this is the amount. This is the theoretical yield. Okay. Yeah, and we we just put. And then this is how much is actually produced. Yeah. So we do actual over theoretical times 100 um and i would do like you know 9e negative 5 the 1.5 is the same thing as 3 over 2 so maybe i would do 3 over 2 e negative 4 to get um i could do like 27 divided by Two, one, three, kind of like 13 E minus um, the uh, minus nine. Wait, that's not right. But let's see, nine E minus five over 1.5. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just round the bottom to be two, 4.5 e negative five plus four e minus one. I think I'm, okay, so wait, wait. Nine, nine is divided, nine divided by 1.5 is six. Just an always said. Sorry. No, it's, there you this go. is like the, the least important part. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so here, so. basically, 
Um, you know, do we, which reactant do we use? Well, whichever one is the limiting reagent. Yeah, okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Now there's this. Okay, three grams of uh, a particular triglyceride, molecular weight or molar weight or whatever, uh, 500 grams per mole uh, are completely saponified. What's that? Uh, it's basically breaks down the uh, triglyceride. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like when you use soap. So like uh, yep. the glycerol molecules, They just become like uh they just have OHs, like the glycerol. I mean it just turns into glycerol. Yep, yep. With alcohol groups. Yeah, uh so the, the glycerol, um, and then like the three fatty acids, right? They So they separate. yep. Um, okay. Under basic conditions to break all ester bonds and the products of this reaction are then extracted with dilute aqueous um, acid. The fatty acid products are then dried and quantified by a titration. What volume of one molar titrant is needed to reach the equivalence point? Um, okay. So we can take the mass given of the triglyceride, particular triglyceride, we could use the molar mass to figure out the moles of that, right? Right, So the mole. Yeah. basically three grams are broken down. Uh-huh. Like we get the moles, but then what? We divide by three. This would be Um, sorry, what were you saying? Do we just like divide by three or what? Divide by three? Why, why don't we divide it by three? Here? Um, I'm just uh, finding the moles of the triglyceride here. Um, but when you then break it down, you break it down. Oh, you're, I see what you're asking. Okay. So yeah, since a triglyceride is the glycerol and three fatty acids, when you break that bond, you get three fatty acids, right? And they're saying that they're taking the fatty acid pro uh, products and they're doing titration on that. So, um, so if this is the amount of triglyceride, we would actually multiply it by three to get each triglyceride has one has three fatty acids. So if we multiply this by three, that'll give us, so this is six E minus three. If you multiply it by three, you would get the number of fatty acids, right? So that would be 18, uh, whoops, E minus three, um, moles of fatty acid, right? Okay. And, um, okay, the titrant is one molar. Oh, okay. So, well, okay. So we're, we're titrating fatty acids, right? Mm -hmm. So what can we eliminate here in these choices? We're titrating a fatty acid, which means we're going to use a base. So we eliminate A and C. Good. Um, and now if it's one molar of titrant, which is one mole per liter, and we need, we can just make a little proportion here. So 18 E minus three moles, right? One milliliter. 18, wait, sorry.
that would just wait. So that'll just be because it's a one to one here. So this will just be eighteen e negative three mill uh liters, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's zero point zero one eight liters, or that's that's eighteen milliliters, right? Yeah. Right. And so for the equivalent at the equivalence point, um mm -hmm. so look for half equivalence for half equivalence point, the main two things you need to know is pH equals pK and then the um the amount of deprotonated acid is the same as well the amount of base is the same as acid. Wait. Um the molar concentration. Well, so uh So, well, the equivalence point is when you have moles of titrant equals moles of analyte. But how about the half equivalence point? Half equivalence point will be, well, you know, half of that. <laughs> That's when, but that is when you will have pH is equal to pKa or like the first pKa. So, but yeah, that's when half of the, the analyte has reacted with the titrant. What I get tripped up on, what is the difference between moles titrant equals moles titrant versus oh titrant versus analyte yeah so something like that right titrant analyte right and let's say you know ph and you know milliliters of titrant added right so you know some whatever something like that So the titrant is the thing that you add dropwise. And the equivalence point is when you have an equal amount. So like, you know, if the, uh, it, the, the equivalence point. So like, okay, if you add a strong acid analyte, strong base titrant, it would look like this, where the equivalence point would be like right here at like whatever, seven. let's say. So that's when each molecule of titrant neutralizes or reacts with each molecule of analyte. So like if it was a strong acid, uh, analyte, strong base, titrant, right? These would neutralize one another, like pretty much just producing H2O. That's why it'll have like, you know, a pH of seven. Um, now, at the equivalence point is when the moles of titrant equals the moles of the analyte. So that's the equivalence point. Um, and how do you know if you should calculate like the titrant or the analyte? So the titrant we're adding bit by bit. So that's not going to help us find the equivalence point. But the analyte is a fixed value. Like it, we aren't, we're not adding analyte. We're not removing analyte. So however many moles of the analyte we have must equal the number of moles of titrant that we need to get to the equivalence point. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if we had... two molar HCl here, and we had like, whatever, um, one molar NaOH here. This is a strong acid titrated by a strong base, and each molecule of HCl would be neutralized by each molecule of NaOH. So the equivalence point, is it going to be when... this turns into two molar or this turns into one molar? No, because molar molarity is moles over liters and you can change the molarity by changing the volume, right? Uh, so it's not gonna be molarity that's equal, but moles that are equal to be at the equivalence point. So 
Yeah. So the equivalence point is when the moles of the titrant is equal to the moles of the analyte, which means that it would ultimately be equal to the moles of the analyte that you start off with because we're the analyte is the thing we don't change. So that's equivalence point. And then half equivalence point is something you'll see more when you are dealing with weak titrations that look, you know, like, you know, something like that, right? If this is like a weak acid uh, titration here uh, by like, let's say a weak base, you can see your like equivalence point would be less than seven or sorry. Yeah. Well, it won't be seven. So whichever is stronger, if the acid is stronger, it'll be less than seven. If uh, the base is stronger, it'll be greater than seven, but you'll have this flat ish buffer region. And the middle of that is where your half equivalence point will be. Okay. But that would be um that would be present uh like in that kind of like plat in this like flat in this flat region. Um and that's where so that essentially means that you're gonna see that at half equivalence point uh for like um weak titrations, uh not strong titrations because that would just look like the sigmoidal shape but if it's weak it'll be more flat but yeah okay then so also in regards to what you told me before why is this deal? oh that's exactly what i drew yeah i know <laughs> but yeah um but then why is the answer not why is it not all of them then uh, let me see. Look at this. Yeah. Phosphate can be classified as what type of base? Um, so let's see. I see what you're saying. Wait. Okay. Hold on. Let me, let me see. So what type of base? Arrhenius base, Bronze Lowry base, Lewis base. Um, Yeah, what do they say down here? Because they drew it the same way. Oh, wait, crap. No, okay, okay. No, it, it makes sense. Okay, let's go back up. So, I mean, so this thing, the circle thing means that you can have Arrhenius acids that are not Bronsted Lowry or Lewis acids, right? Um, wait, hold on here. Phosphate, what type of base? Ah, okay, okay. So you could have... You could have bronzed Lowry acids or bases that are not Arrhenius acids or bases, right? Repeat that. So, like, you could have um, bronzed Lowry bases that are not Arrhenius bases from the circle thing. Like, you could have something here that must be a Lewis base, but not a Rainius base. You could have, like, so you can't have, so like, okay, if we had something that was an Arrhenius base, it must also be a Bronsted Lowry base and a Lewis base, right? Yeah. But you could have a Bronsted Lowry base that isn't an Arrhenius base. Right. Right. But are there any other exceptions that I have to know? This isn't even an exception because it's just this circle thing. That means that what this means is that um is that 
Well, you can have an Arrhenius base that can also be can so so I'll put it like this. So like if you have a Bronze Lowry base, let's say A, right? It's still and it, I drew it here. It's still in the circle of Lewis base. So A is both a Bronze Lowry base and a Lewis base, but it's not in the circle for the Arrhenius base. Yeah. Right? It's almost like if you had like, you know, I don't know, like integers, um, I don't know, rational numbers, right? Like you could have, maybe that isn't a good example, but you let, let's say that you have, um, so, so all Brown said Lowry bases must still be Lewis bases, right? But not all Lewis bases must be Bronson Larry bases. And then mm -hmm. same thing with Arrhenius, right? You could have Bronson Larry bases that are not Arrhenius bases, but every Arrhenius base must still be a Bronson Larry base. That's like so what this the circle stuff means. Um in terms of like subsets. So all Arrhenius bases are Lewis bases. Sorry? All Arrhenius bases are Lewis bases. He said are Lewis bases? Yeah. And all Arrhenius bases are Bronze Larry bases. Not that part, right? Oh, what? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, all bases could be called Lewis bases. Um... So, yeah. But then so, why didn't they draw this the other way? So what I mean by that is, if you have a Bronson Larry base here, it's still within the Lewis base circle. If you have an Arrhenius base here, it's still within the Lewis base circle. So all of that stuff would be true. But for instance, you could have something that's a Lewis base here, that is not Bronte, Lowry, or Arrhenius. So it's uh, that kind of thing. Okay. Here. This is uh, what I wanted to write. So. Yeah. So. Real numbers, rational numbers, integers, whole numbers, natural numbers. So integers, right? Uh, or rather, whole numbers could be like one, two, three, four. But it, what about, let's say 3.5. 3.5 is not going to be in the circle for a whole number not going to be in a circle for a natural number but 3.5 could be in the circle for the for an integer right and it can also be a rational number and it can also be a real number right mm -hmm. so um but let's say we have 3. Point, you know pi right that's not going to be a rational number so it's not going to be any of these things here but it can still be a real number. So that's just what I mean by like, you know, those circles. Like if something is still, so like basically the larger circle includes the smaller circles. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is crazy. Okay, next is uh we have thirty minutes. I want us to go over buoyancy again. Or buoy yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, like 
usual. I'm just going to ask you what are, you know, like, I want to, I want to know, like, what are you thinking, I guess, as you do this, like in terms of what you, how you approach it. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, here it gives us uh density. Um, basically, like since we see one liter equals one thousand centimeters, so third power, we can find the volume, which gives us the value in centimeters, so third power, and then we get the liters. And then we use this proportion to get the grams value. Okay. Spherical weather balloon is filled with helium gas with a density of about 0.18 grams per liter. If the diameter of the balloon is 20 meters, okay, R is 10 meters then, right? Yeah. What is the approximate mass? Okay, then we, here we have density of helium. Approximate mass of the helium in the um, balloon. Okay, and uh, so, okay. Um, uh, so like, okay, density is mass over volume and we have the volume of the sphere equation and we have radius. So we can plug in the radius into the volume of the sphere equation. And then we can get the volume of the balloon and we can multiply the volume of the balloon by uh, the density of the balloon. And then we'd get the mass of the balloon, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's do this. Four over three. I always, so here's a little cool thing that I found out three on the bot, I mean, pi is essentially three. So four over three times three, they cancel. So it's just gonna be four R cubed, right? So four, 10 to the power, or I could do this, oops. That to get four E three. Um, cubic meters um, and do you know how we would convert cubic meter into cubic centimeters? One times 10 to the six. Good. So um, I could do one times 10 to the negative negative six six yeah if i do the meter part um So, okay, 4e3 over 1e6, negative 6, I'm multiplying these, so that'll be negative 6 plus 3, negative 3, 4, I guess just 4, negative Three, one, three. Oh, you forgot to uh do the radius to the third power. Oh damn it! Okay. Oh uh, yeah. wait. Radius is ten meters. Oh wait, no. Then I, I don't know. And I'm cubing this. Yeah. One e three. So yeah, I don't know. Um, so let's let me uh. Do this. Um one uh cubic 
meter. Um, if you have one e minus six meters, this is only a cubic centimeter, then one thousand cubic centimeters, one liter, or I don't want to waste time on this, honestly, so. All right, I think it's uh, that. Hmm? So, yeah, I got that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a 4E3 over here. So, um, so yeah, you can hide this for a sec. I can show you what I did. So, I did... Oh, it doesn't... Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so so uh, so basically, I did the um, oh, it was a different question, but mm -hmm. no, I know, I I just can't undo the answer. Oh, okay, but if you go to that other question, oh, I see, what, yeah, I see what you mean. So yeah, I just basically, yeah, I plugged it in, um, to get four e three, and then I converted it into cubic centimeters. And I got 43 cubic centimeters. And uh, then I just multiplied that by that 
0.18, which I just turned into 2e minus 2. And then I got this. And then I you just round down a little bit. And then you get the 750. So yeah. Make sense? Uh, no. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Yep. Hold on. Where'd you get 2e negative 2 from? Oh, no. So the uh, 0.18 grams per liter. Um, yeah. I just oh. it into 0.2. Oh, okay. Yeah. But the main thing that I was doing wrong the first time around was this calculation, this thing. Mm -hmm. But so, but yeah, when you do, all right, when you do this one over here, you end up with 4e9 cubic centimeters, and then you convert that into liters. So one liter, they said, was 1,000 cubic centimeters. So then this is going to be 46 liters. And then I multiply that by the this thing for the liters to cancel and for the answer to be in grams. And then, uh, and then that's going to be that right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, next is this. This is the star of the show. The, like this is the actual problem. Um this is like the conceptual part mm -hmm. about the topic. Oh yeah, I think we did this before, right? We did. Was it in one of the videos? Uh no, I think I, I sent this to you a couple of months ago. But yeah, so it's still a good a good problem to do. So Buoyant, okay, balloons can be used to carry loads upwards, uh, upward in the air using buoyant force. Um, a balloon of volume 14,000 cubic meters um, is filled with hydrogen gas of density that. Um, the density of air is that. Which expression gives the ma uh, maximum possible mass of the load that can be lifted by the balloon? So... Point force problems, I would start drawing a free body diagram. So we have a mass, or sorry, we have gravity bringing it down, which is just your mg. And opposing gravity would be the buoyant force. So buoyant force here. Do you remember what, um, how we can express that? Um, PVG. Yep. So rho, so it's rho. So, okay, we have more than one rho value, right? How do we know if that's going to be like, uh, like rho of the air or rho of the hydrogen? What's it displays? What's up? Yeah, yeah. So what's being displaced? Um, hydrogen. So, um, so think about it like this. So like if something, if you put something in water, then the thing that's being displaced is the water, right? Yeah. Now, if you're not in the water, you're still in something. there yep so so if you're displacing something it's going to be displacing the air right okay so yeah so if you are confused about you know if something is if it's are we going to use this or that uh think about what is the thing that we're talking about in right and Ooh. you know yeah. it's either going to be in water or in air, right? Uh, so this would be rho of the uh, air, and it would be the volume of air that is displaced, which is easy for these types of problems where something's fully submerged um, because the volume of the object will be equal to the volume of the fluid displaced. It can be a little annoying if it's like, you know, half submerged. Um, and then G, right? So that's 
our buoyancy expression. Now, I'm going to do this in green just to show that this is a, a, a big important step for these problems. So the big kind of leap here is this mg value we can turn into, because rho is mass over volume. So rho v would be mass over volume times volume, which is just mass, right? Okay. So this we can write as rho of the H2 gas, volume of the balloon times G. So now we can have it like in the same language as the buoyant force, right? Cool. With the rho value. Um, and that's going to be something you're going to do for probably like, you know, all these buoyant force problems, this step here, right? Uh, now, from there, you can kind of see that, um, well, okay, so now that we have both of these forces, right, we can bring them together with Newton's second law, right? Yeah. With, you know, the sum of all the forces or the net force. So we can say that, you know, the uh, sum of the forces. So we can say like, you know, um, the, uh, um, okay, F net would be F G minus F B. They might have it in with the other thing, the other way around, uh, but this would equal mass times acceleration, right? Yeah. And so then this could be um the okay, I think typically people make the down one uh negative and the up one positive. So I'm just gonna do that. So buoyancy going up, I'm making positive, gravity going down, negative. Um, and now I can plug in uh, the air uh, volume G minus rho H2 gas volume G is equal to M A. And um, from here, I can do, I can pull out the VG, right? just do the uh, row of air. So I could do um, BG row of air minus row of H2 gas is equal to mass times acceleration. Um, and then to solve for mass, I would divide both sides by acceleration. which is going to be kind of like little g, because little g is the acceleration caused by gravity. So that value should cancel, right? Yeah. And then we're left with this, right? So volume times rho in parentheses, rho of air minus rho of the H2 gas. So uh, that one, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so buoyancy, point force stuff, you want to think what is the fluid that is being displaced? That's going to be represented in the buoyancy, for the, for the Archimedes, you know, row of the fluid displaced volume times volume of the fluid displaced times G. Um, and then something will have a uh, weight caused by gravity. And that is typically MG. But in order for us to make it something that we can work with, we can turn that into rho VG with rho being the density of the object rather than of the fluid. And then we bring them together using Newton's second law. So force of the buoyant force, you know, minus 
gravitational force is equal to ma. And we plug in the rho vg terms. And we the v and the g are the same. So we can factor that out to get this. And then since we're being asked to find mass, we divide both sides by acceleration. And there we go. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Is, uh, so the the only thing is I don't it's hard for me to figure out when it's like what is displacing because it's like either a sinking object or a floating object and the problems. Oh yeah. So so um yeah, so if we think about something so like I guess like what you can think about is just like okay, if something's in water then it's displacing that fluid. If something's not in water, it's in air. So for this question, that's what could have helped uh, for you to think that. Um, and uh, the H2 gas is, it, is what the balloon is filled with. And if it's filled with it, then that's going to play a role in the weight of the balloon. Um, so, oh, but then I guess you said if something's sinking or floating or something like that. What if it's floating, yeah. Yeah, so if it's floating, they'll tell you or give you information that would help you figure out like how much of it is submerged. So like, let's say that this is halfway submerged. In that case, so okay, if it's fully submerged, the volume of the fluid displaced is equal to the volume of the object, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's half submerged, then volume of the fluid displaced will be equal to one half of volume of the object. So that means that you can just, so that means for the, the weight here, it would be rho volume of the object G, but the buoyant force row of the water and instead of writing v fluid we're going to write one half v of the object that way it's in the same term as this and we can you know mess with that and do stuff algebraically so yeah so if something's like partially submerged you'll be able to set it equal to something like that so the amount that's like this place is the buoyant force the buoyant force is caused by the displacement of fluid, yeah. So Archimedes' law essentially states that uh, uh, an object submerged it will displace its own weight in fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts here? So, I mean, I would think it's A or B. Good. Good, good, good. So, we can get rid of C and D. Um, now, when you increase temperature, something gets less dense? Well, let's try this, right? Um. What type would float or or rise? Solid. I mean, um, in terms like for gases, in terms of density, like why would so like helium floats because it's less dense than air, right? Mm -hmm. So. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know how they say heat rises? Okay. What that really means is, so you, so, okay, I guess let me start with this fundamental thing. So buoyant force, why is that even a thing? Well, if you were just in space and let's say you're in, in a container of water in space, there's not going to be a buoyant force because there's not a gravity. 
right? But when you have gravity, if you take some object and you put it in water, gravity pulls it down. And that means that it, that the, you know, molecules of the water will resist that. Because when you're pushing something down against water or some fluid, it will like move away. But as it does that, it, it provides resistance against it. So that's why you will have your buoyant force, right? Now, same thing with heat rising. Heat doesn't just rise because of nothing. Uh, what really happens is molecules of air or anything is be are being brought pulled down by gravity. And that's why if you have something very dense compared to something less dense, they're all being pulled down by gravity. But the denser thing can go through like the gaps between the less dense thing. And that's why if something is denser than, let's say, air, it will sink. If something is less dense than air, it will rise. But it's more accurate to say, instead of saying heat rises, it's more accurate to say heat floats. Okay. Now, if you heat something, you're like a gas or something, right? You're adding your weight, uh, you're increasing the speed at which the molecules are moving. But that also means that they are going to be more likely to expand, right? Because if we think about cooling something, we're think about the end result of, a co of cooling something, we get a solid, right? And typically that's denser than a liquid, right? Which is denser than a gas. So if you cool something, it's going to get more dense. If you heat something up, it's going to get less dense because the molecules are going to move around faster and, you know, more so. So that's why heated air would be more dense. Sorry, my bad. Heated air will be less dense. And if something is less dense, it's going to float on top of things that are more dense thus rise so for this question here with this versus this right you didn't even need if you didn't know that heated air is less dense right you can see that this says if it's denser it will rise right and this says less dense it'll rise so regardless of what happens with heated air be cannot be true intrinsically. If something becomes denser, it should not rise. Mm -hmm. So like a couple of times you saw today, we were, I, there were ways for us to kind of like figure something out without necessarily knowing it factually, just from the question choice itself being intrinsically untrue. And this is, this is an example of that. You cannot have something that becomes more dense, that rises. Right. Yeah. But but yes, to answer your question, heated air gets less dense. And if something's less dense, it will float, essentially, or rise. And that's what it means when people say heat rises. Huh. Yep. And that's, why a hot, that's how a hot air balloon works. Yeah. Uh, do you have another student? I just had like... One more question or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. I don't have any any okay. more. Uh this is another thing. It's conceptual that. So I wanted to say that the chemical the gases that were used in World War One for chemical warfare had were denser than air because you know, in World War One, there's trench warfare. And the trenches are underground, right? So okay. they use gases that were more dense than air, so it sinks. But okay, the liquid is at its exact boiling point. Um, what? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, this is a good 
Um, okay, what'll happen to the liquid when a small amount of heat is added to it? Okay, so like those graphs like this, right? Um, like with uh, heat being added to it and temperature here, right? So like, you know, something like this means as we add temp as we add heat, the temperature increases and temperature definition is average kinetic energy of the molecules. Um, now, the flat portion here clearly shows that we can add heat with the temperature not rising, right? So that must mean that the heat that we're adding, if it's not causing an increase in temperature, what is it doing, right? Well, what it's doing is it's breaking the intermolecular bonds that cause that to be at that phase. So let's say we start with a solid, right? And we raise heat and that raises the temperature. And then this point here, could be the melting point. Um, and so that would be like solid here and by the end of that liquid. So what happens in that plateau is that the heat goes towards breaking the intermolecular bonds that form that solid, turning it into a liquid. Um, and then as you add heat to the liquid, the temperature increases until you get to your boiling point, right? At which point it will start to plateau again because now the heat that you're adding, instead of it raising the temperature, it goes towards breaking the intramolecular bonds that cause it to be a liquid and ends up as a gas. Okay, so, so, so here if we're saying the liquid is... Uh, at its exact boiling point, what will happen to the liquid when a small amount of heat is added to it? Well, what we know is, so we can see that the boiling point, melting point are flat, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning temperature doesn't change. Well, when it's flat, yeah, it's not changing. Correct. So... Uh, and it's flat whenever you have that phase change, right? So yeah, we can get rid of the choices that say that the temperature will change, right? Mm -hmm. Good. So now, uh, so now we will have liquid turning into gas. So either all of it will turn to gas or a small amount of it will turn to gas. So I'd say small. Yep, because they're saying a small amount of heat, right? And so like this thing over here with the arrow, what I mean by this is at this point, it's 100% liquid. And, you know, it'll go like 99% liquid, 1% gas, and it'll keep going until you reach the end of this plateau phase. And that point, so it'll be like 100% liquid, 0% gas at the beginning of the plateau, right? And by the end of this plateau, like there, it'll be 100% or 0% liquid, 100% gas, right? And like in the middle, it'll be 50-50, but you see how like, you know, going from here, the percentage of it being liquid goes down and the percentage of it being gas goes up. Yeah, yeah. And so if they're saying a small amount of heat, we're talking about like right there or here because heat is the x-axis here. So small amount of it will turn to gas and temperature will be the same, yeah. Okay. Uh, and also, so I was... um. I was doing, as I said, I was, I've been trying to get better at the electric comp stuff. I was doing a Jack Wesson passage mm -hmm. or a practice set here. Mm -hmm. um, I was just a little confused because 
they just ask us for it's straightforward. They ask us for the yep. sub potential and if it's spontaneous or not. Um, so, yeah. So check this out, right? So the half reactions here uh, with their reduction potentials, right? So, so whichever one has the higher reduction potential will be reduced, right? That's what I thought. Okay. And whatever has the um the uh the the smaller reduction potential um would be the thing that gets oxidized, right? Wait, so you're saying that I thought that was wrong. Let's see. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So they give us this chemical reaction here. Yep, yep. So this goes from zero to plus, and this goes from two plus to zero. So this shows us that the uh, AU is losing electrons, right? So what we have to follow that over the yeah so, so the reason is by default like a lot of times there's like a full like table of half reactions that you'll see and they're by default written as reduction half reactions but yeah here since we're given the uh reaction like that is what tells us you know what gets oxidized what gets reduced so the the chemical reaction because look like the reason is that sure this could be the reduction potential for gold and this could be the reduction potential for copper uh but that's like just by itself right but they're giving us a special reaction right which involves like you know uh, gold being, you know, um, we don't know if this is going to be an electrochemical cell or an electrolytic cell, basically. Yeah. So okay. chemical reaction is what's important here because that tells us what's happening. And it tells us that the gold gets oxidized and the copper gets reduced. And then the, the half reactions here, then we just have to adjust it. So this goes that way. And so this oxidation potential will be negative 1.6 and the copper gets reduced and that stays 0.34. And if you add those, that gives you a negative uh, value, which means non-spontaneous. So yeah, so this case, uh, it's the chemical reaction because they're saying, you know, what's the standard blah, blah, blah for the following reaction. So that is what is important here. Mm -hmm. okay. now we know that it happens to be an electrolytic cell like this is something that's happening in an electrolytic cell but we don't know that going into it uh so yeah the chemical reaction is what matters okay all right Whatever. Uh, that's it. That's it. That's it. Awesome. Um. Yeah. Hour and ten minutes. Uh, taking my the blueprint exam tomorrow. So. Okay. So. Yeah. You're gonna be using that timing strategy that we talked about with checkpoints. Uh, 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 is it the one in your Google Drive or? Um, I think so, but basically. What time is right? Yeah. So basically, uh, you're only going to look at the clock three times per section instead of like always looking at it. So when you get up to question 20, look at the clock. You should have an hour left. If you don't, adjust your pace. If you, uh, and then when you get to question 30, you should have 45 minutes left. And when you get to question 40, you should have 30 minutes left. And so that's three does. So instead of looking at the clock while you're doing problems, which is distracting, you have three designated checkpoints where you'll look at the map, uh, where you, you'll look at the 
clock and adjust your pace. And also, you know, if any question feels like it's taking longer than a minute and a half, make an educated guess, flag it, and move on. Um, and uh, yeah. And Except you... question 20 is an hour left. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Basically, you know, I'm just dividing it into thirds. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's that. And, um, oh, it's an ask, like, you know, from the, during that tutorial, like, do you do, like, brain dump where you write stuff on a, on a... What's your take on that? Because, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't. But there was this guy on YouTube that posted this video. Mm -hmm. He got a 517. And he, but he would basically explain that that's what he did. Like he had a sheet that yeah. he wrote every day and yeah. put into his long term memory, yeah. and he would write it before. You know, like it was like four pages of like all the super high yield stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it would be more so the stuff that aren't completely in your long term memory. So like it would be kind of like a brain dump. But there would be things that yeah would be in my long term memory that I would put down. Like I I would draw like the optics chart. table uh mm -hmm. that way i get to see like right away uh without having to do like whatever the calculation but also like equations and formulas that you might not have completely like stuff that you don't trust that you have like in your memory like really really well so that could be yeah it could be optics table it could be equations it could be stuff about particular amino acids if that's a thing it could be you know, um, just, just stuff that you feel like, you know, that you might benefit from having in front of you. Uh, so like maybe for you, like that circle thing with the bronze Larry acids and all that stuff or stuff like that you might forget. So yeah, it's up to you, but yeah, I, I would use that first 15 minutes of tutorial to just brain dump stuff. So I remember I would write the optics table. I would write, um, I mean, at the time I like memorized certain like fraction values, um, you know, it, that might be helpful, but uh, yeah, I would say things like that. Things like the optics table and just stuff that you feel like could be easy for you to forget. Yeah. So. Um, a good one would be writing out like uh, cause like yeah, cause like today. So writing out like uh, for instance, like um, how many cubic meters is in like a liter, mm -hmm. something like that. Cause today we had to deal with some problems where we had to do that, and that. became like an extra step that could be something that you can possibly get wrong. So let's see. Um, a million liters is equal to a thousand cubic centimeters, or it'd probably be easier to say one cubic centimeters to liters. Yeah, one cubic meter is equal to a thousand liters. If you If we had that memorized, that question where we did that math would have been instant. Yeah. So things like that I would write. So like yeah, things like that that can that can help. Um they can help you, you know, do the math faster, stuff like that. So yeah. So like if you look here. Uh -huh. This guy mm -hmm. he would write out all of this. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Is that overkill? I mean, if you can, because, I mean, he's writing out a lot that can be, and all of this stuff is pretty useful, definitely. You have the IR values there. Um. Yeah, and you have... I mean, like, sure, yeah, it's it's on the overkill side, but yeah. I would like 
you know, look at this and see what you can benefit from. Yeah, also that, like, the different uh, inhibitors, like, the stuff that's just, like, is kind of annoying to remember, like, mm -hmm. I, I would forget, like, uncompetitive versus non-competitive, like, right. one does what to the, like, the cam goes down in this case and up in that case, mm -hmm. I would write stuff like that. Uh, the different uh, epimers here, um, you know, as well. And yeah, a good amount of this stuff. Um, so I I sent you like that. Did I ever send you that like Jack Weston cheat sheet? Uh, of formulas? That was everything. Here, I'm going to send uh, Resend it. I'm not sure if you did. Take a look at the this cheat sheet and look for things that you find. It's it, this has a lot of pages, but it's really really good and full of really good stuff. So take a look at it and see what things you can benefit from writing down yourself. But I mean, I would definitely like sometimes with students like uh, they tell me like writing stuff out in the beginning like would kind of stress them out. So I kind of made that less of a thing that I talked about. But I definitely. would spend that uh, first, you know, 15 minutes of tutorial time brain dumping stuff. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've, you've never sent this to me. I've never seen this before. So. Okay. Yeah, this is this is really good. So yeah, you can you can um, yeah, go through that and see what you can benefit from, you know, putting down, you know, also, like I saw, like, he put like some amino acid stuff there. So Like, like, I would maybe even write like, okay, Saren and 3NN, I know that they both have OH groups, but like, you know, how are they different, right? And it's like 3NN is like one things like branch. Yeah. So just little things like that. So yeah, just take a look at look through the cheat sheet and see and the one that you showed me and see what you can benefit from. Um, uh, from having like, That they're right in front of you that you don't have to spend extra steps or you know brain power to do like that uh one cubic meter is a thousand liters that would have been very helpful for that problem that we did today so things like that can really help Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. awesome so um i think we did two hours 20 minutes right Uh, yes, yes, that is correct. Sorry. Two hours, 20 minutes. Um, so that'll just be, oops, uh, once in E5. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Good luck tomorrow. And I will see you like that.